<laughs> okay, guys, here we are. We're going to be talking today about the uh, guide to the rent cap and suspension of evictions. This yep. is the controversial An interesting one. Yep. Yeah, this is the controversial, as far as I'm concerned, it's controversial. Yeah. Um, the controversial legislation that Patrick Harvey, the Minister for Tenants, has put in place, uh, uh, um, describing it as some sort of emergency situation and the fact that all of a sudden everybody's not going to have a house to live in um, and this is why we've got to protect everybody. Um, but the reality is, unless we've got somebody to live in our house as a landlord, <laughs> then, yeah. then we've got no income. So they're definitely going to be living in a house and we're not going to, we're not going to evict people. No. Um, as landlords, and um, we've got no desire to do that at all. Um, but we're going to talk about the detrimental effect. So, but it could have, um, from a landlord's perspective, on the tenant. After all, the most important thing here, and oh God, I hate to say it, I can't disagree. I can't disagree with Patrick Harvey. The most important thing is the tenant. Just going to say, I think that's important to to make that yeah. clear before we start talking today. Obviously, this is from a landlord's perspective. Yeah, but from, the most, one of the most important things to us as agents and landlords. And a letting agent's perspective. Tenant. So I'm the landlord, Richard. You're the letting agent. Yeah. Um. And 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 I've been in this for thirty years, and it's the way I see it, and it's the detrimental effect and impact it will have on tenants because of this legislation. It's nothing to do with the fact that. Landlords want to run about in Ferraris and earn lots of money. Yeah. Um, landlords have homes that they're not wanting to give people and sell to people. It's the fact that there's tenants out there in a vulnerable situation, and this legislation is actually penalising these tenants. As it's always, actually, the tenant ends up suffering. Yeah, the tenants suffering because of the legislation. So while the Scottish government and Patrick Harvey, well, the Greens, uh, let's be honest, and the, the SNP is obviously basically abdicated this responsibility, even though we have a housing minister, which should actually be going, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't go in line with my housing policy, has basically abdicated this all, and this is me being very political, abdicated this all to the Greens in order to get their votes so they can get their budget through the parliament, or they would never get it through without their votes. And this is what it's all about. So uh, the way I see it is landlords and letting agents have been thrown as the sacrificial lambs um, to the slaughter and vilified um, because of this. However, as I say, I come back to saying is this does affect the tenant in a detrimental way. And it's something that I've, I've been lobbying since the very start of COVID. And, and I've been lobbying, and she knows this, as Jenny Gilruth, the MSP, who was the transport minister at the time, but she was our MSP, and I was lobbying her to lobby on my behalf the housing minister, who was Shona Robson, and yeah. the fact that how this affects tenants on the ground and how it makes it difficult for us to take tenants from a vulnerable background because of the legislation itself. And that's my rhetoric about the fact that, you know, the, the most vulnerable people in our society are actually losing out because of this legislation. Yeah. Richard, could you could you explain where it all where, how it all started, what it is, and what we're actually yeah. talking about? Yeah, I mean, obviously, as a letting agent and a reputable letting agent, I would uh, obviously consider myself. We understand the importance of it to keep in landlords and tenants informed mm -hmm. of the current regulations and things that are affecting them and the five rental market. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the um, how we provide landlords with all that essential information and we're going to run through things like the rent cap and the suspension on evictions in Scotland yeah, and things yeah. as well. So the currently where we are, the rent cap in Scotland currently is set at 3% in most cases and it's set to be extended for an additional six months. Mm -hmm. Now previously the rent freeze was at 0%, obviously people might not be aware of that but we all we are all too well and was in effect from the 6th of September 2022 to the 31st of March this year, 2023. And then from the 1st of April, the Scottish Government increased the cap. So we were allowed to then obviously increase rents by 3%. And this was due to remain in place until September this year. And that's obviously still, and that's the current situation that we're in. However, as you say, Jim, Patrick Harvey is the Minister for Tenants Rights in Scotland, and he's expressed a desire to extend this and extend these measures and, and take it right through into next year in March, 2024. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Parliament's approval would mark the final date for the rent cap and eviction proceedings, obviously, on that 
uh, protections. So, and that's where we currently are at the minute. But Parliament's uh, really thinking uh, different uh, because Parliament uh, actually thinks that on a on a macro scale that this is actually going to solve their problems. Yeah. And no one wants to protect a private landlord. Let's be honest, no politician wants to stand behind a private landlord and say this is unfair um, because it's almost political suicide in terms of how they do it. Because we're just a small population of people. Um, we're, um, we're a minority group of people, and I will say minority group of people, who represent around about 250,000 people out of 5.5 uh, 5 million people in Scotland. So we're in a very, very minority and it just so happens they've taken the opportunity to uh, basically vilify and pick on the minority in order to appease the majority. Yeah. So under the current rules um, of the rent cap, you know, what, what actually happens next, Richard? I mean, what is the current rules and what happens? And so the current right rules, as, it, as it's outlined in the Cost of Living Tenant Protection uh, Scotland Bill of 2022, yeah. A rent freeze and suspension on evictions was implemented from the 6th of September 22, like I said, to the 31st of March this year. And then any notices to increase the rent issued on or after the 6th of September uh, were then rendered void. So rent increases mm -hmm. given before this date, however, they, they remain valid. So that, yeah, that, was, yeah. that was how it was. But since the 1st of April, rent increases have been capped at the 3% for most private landlords. And though they can apply for the increase up to 6%, now Jim, we've, we've been through this process and, and looked at to cover specific costs, evictions will continue to be prevented from certain, with certain exemptions. So, so let's look which at that. Which is anti-social okay. things. So from the 1st of April 2023, rent, rent increases have been capped at 3%. Uh, yes. but, but, so you can get 3%. But So what do you do as a landlord if you're capped at the 3%, but your costs are going up? For example, your mortgage is from 120 and it's now 350 pound. So effectively, your cost um, from 350 minus 120 is 230 divided by 120. Your costs have gone up almost 200 percent. So your costs so, as a landlord have gone up 200 percent, but you're only allowed to charge three percent of the rent. Well, you can you can do the six percent. You need to reply. You need to apply to Rent Service Scotland for that. Okay. But you need to say, you need so to typically, be, uh, typically, um, uh, I'll give me a second. Uh, that's six percent of uh, which represents thirty-three pound. Yeah, six percent of five hundred and fifty pound uh, rent rent a month. So six percent. But there's a hidden agenda here because the six mm -hmm. percent isn't really six percent, is it? No, and that's in what order, I was going to say. Our experience is in order to get in order to get the six percent, you have to demonstrate your costs have gone up twelve percent because it's fifty percent of whatever the costs have gone it was 50 percent of whatever the costs have gone up or six percent whichever is lesser right yeah so and i've experienced this because i said well my costs have obviously gone up eight percent and then i put it to the rent assessor and the rent assessor yeah that's fine so we can give you four percent sorry yeah sorry my costs have gone eight percent you're only giving me four how's that and it's like, well, it's only based on the last six months. So in other words, we're making it a finite amount of time. So your cost going up in the last six months is very difficult. So if, you've, if you're a landlord right now, you better actually get your justification in pretty quick because interest rates are going up right now and they will stop going up in the next couple of months probably. Therefore, if you, start, if you don't increase your rent before then, therefore you could be stuck where you can't actually increase your rent because each month it drops off of the cost goes into that perpetual six months it carries on. So six months from now, if interest rates stop today going up, you can't use interest rates anymore as a reason for putting your rents up. Even though even though you did it to be nice to the tenant and actually yeah. didn't, you're stuck between a rock and you're a hard place. Stuck, yeah. So Yeah, and I, I, that's not that was never made clear. And, and it wasn't until we went, I mean, we've done it for other landlords and things and helped them through that process. Yeah. And it's not until you go through the process that you actually realise that's how it works. So my costs have to go up 200%, but I'm only allowed to charge a tenant 3%. So if I if the man costs of this is this is a this is actually a case study, by the way, yeah. 350 minus 120. So if I'm another 230 pounds a month and I can I could only charge 33 pounds, I've effectively got to find 197 pounds extra and absorb that cost. Now, most landlords only make about one and a half thousand, maybe a thousand pounds a year out of a, 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 pro, a property. Um, in, in terms of revenue, in terms of profit at the end, or, or yeah. would I say, let's use the word surplus. 
Yeah. Because most landlords don't actually go and spend the money. They just reinvest it back in because most landlords use this as a pension. Yeah. And and this is where the vilification comes out in the fact that you shouldn't be owning two. You should. It's a, it's almost like you know. It's people are saying it's it's not fair to own more than one property because you're taking advantage of somebody. It's and making a profit out of them. Okay, let's analyze that. I'm taking advantage of somebody because this is a question I've been given. I'm taking advantage of somebody, and um, because I'm housing, I'm putting a roof over their head because I've got nowhere else to go. And they can't buy a house anyway because they're on universal credit. Mm -hmm. But I'm taking advantage of them but by putting a roof over their head when the local authority can't. Um, so I'm taking advantage of them. Is that, is that not a fair accurate description? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I'm the, amount really times, advantage. And the amount of now, times over the years. I'm let's look at the other way. For most people out there, we've all got pensions. And the people that say you're taking advantage of a tenant in that situation, and most people have pensions, you'll find that your pension actually invests in Diageo, which is a drinks company, Betfair, or William Hill, which is a betting company, Bat Industries, which is a smoking and vaping company, oh, yeah. yeah, and and various other um, pharmaceuticals like Galaxo, Smith Klein, Beecham. So there's another one, another two, actually. So if I'm taking advantage of somebody, a tenant, because I'm putting a roof over their head, which is, you know, in my opinion, is the most admirable thing to do, put a roof over somebody's head when they don't have one and they've got no other alternative and they have to be homeless, then what is it when you invest in your pension then, when you're investing in companies that uh, basically concentrate on, on making money out of people's addictions? So addiction to alcohol, addiction to... Uh, drink, addiction to tobacco and vaping, uh, addiction to gambling, and uh, also taking advantage of people with long-term care because of the pharmaceuticals need to give them the drugs. But you're making a profit out of that. So mm -hmm. anybody out there that tells you, if you're a landlord out there as well, if anybody tells you you shouldn't be making money out of a tenant, then just ask them if they've got a personal pension, and more than likely that pension does invest in that. Now, let's take an extreme example of this. Let's look at Patrick Harvey's pension. Oh, what do you, how, what do you know about Patrick Harvey's pension? Well, I was Patrick just, Harvey's I was just going through my brain. What do you know? <laughs> how do you, what do you know about Patrick Harvey's pension and all the rest of the Scottish Parliament, all, all the rest of the MSP's pensions? Well, incidentally, the MSP get a pension when they join as an MSP. And yeah. that pension, um, you know, that pension, and I've I've checked this, and I've written written to them, and they've written back to me. That pension invests ten percent of its fund in these exact same four industries. So the MSPs that are vilifying landlords right now, including Patrick Harvey, is the very person that's taking advantage of people's addictions for gambling, smoking, drinking, and their long term ill health care that they're required because his pension is making money out of these people. I could maybe just say arrest my case, shouldn't I? Yep. So anybody out there that vilifies a private landlord, think again if you've got a pension. And most people will have company pensions now. So if you're working, you will have a company pension. So I think the expression here is people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Yeah. I think also, like you pointed it out there, Jim, obviously, as ultimately you're putting a roof over people's head, you're providing housing. And, you know, at acting on behalf of hundreds of landlords over the years and yeah. providing housing, the amount of people that have come through the door and been so grateful that they're able to get a house because they couldn't get social housing. They just couldn't. They were literally homeless okay. on the homeless list. And the homeless list, God, that's long <laughs> as, as you like as well. According to the Scottish oh. government, we've got tons of social housing. Well, where is So it? let's look at that then. Let's look at social housing and the Scottish government and their track record. Yeah. Since 2006, the Scottish government has built a total of 7,136 social housing and a social housing and affordable housing as well, by the way. Yeah. So that's even including affordable, which makes it even worse. Every single year since 2006, for the whole of Scotland, 7,000 social 
housing. We'll just say 7,000 through housing. We'll, re we'll maybe get the benefit of the doubt and say affordable housing don't want anything to do with it because affordable housing is bought. Yeah. So it's even less than that for social rentable housing. So that's councils, that's housing associations, that's that's all these people. So they've been given 7,000. And yet, a few years ago, they said to us, we're going to embark on a social housing building policy and build 10,000 council houses or social housing houses for rent every single year for the next 11 years. So we're going to build 110,000 houses. Now, let's look at that then and let's analyze that. Since the beginning of 2006, the, the, the whole of Scotland, the number of houses being built, is meant to be 25,000 every single year. This is the Housing 2040 Bill. This is their, this is their consultation document. They should be building 25,000 houses every single year to keep up with demand in Scotland. And that means net migration, you know, immigration coming in and people going out. And all yeah. that stuff. But migration is about 20,000 people every single year coming into Scotland as opposed to going out. And that's fine if they've got skills, doctors, dentists, all the rest of it, and lawyers. Yeah. And, but that's what we need, skills, to keep our economy going, keep our health service going. Uh, that's fine. So they're meant to be building 25,000 every single year. And go and ask me how many they've built every single year on average. How many have they built on average? 18,000 since 2006. So it doesn't take a daft day to do a calculation here, but I will. 25 minus 18 leaves 7 and there's 17 years i'll give it you know since since 2006 yeah well that leaves a deficit a deficit of 119,000 houses down already but we're going to build another 110 we've not even built 119 yet <laughs> and that's why that's why there are jokes the, that's why we're in the situation that we're in we have we're in the situation that we're in because of the failed coherent strategy on Scottish housing policy. And who do you think is getting the blame for this? Landlords. The private landlord, the second homeowners. You can take every single holiday home. This is 2040 bill again. Their consultation document, everybody can look this up. You can take every single housing, second home, home. you can take every single holiday home, You could take, and you could take them all together. You could take them all back from every, every single empty property is in Scotland. And you'll literally only get ahead of that by two years. In other words, you're only eating to two years of that. So you'll only have 50 or 60,000 properties. So therefore, you'll still have a deficit of, we said 120, 110 equals, right, that minus the 260, minus the 60, given the benefit of doubt, 60. You'll still have a deficit of 170,000 to make up. And that's including the 110 that they're supposed to be doing anyway. So you're still 60,000 behind where they were meant to be in the first place. So regardless of, so that means regardless of anything, the, the, the issue here is not building enough housing. And that's always going to be the issue, no matter how, how they try and go around it or kick it down the road, they still, they're going to have to build new housing. Not, not allowing the system to accommodate the build of more affordable, I mean, no, I mean affordable. Affordable homes under under their legislation is 5% below market value. Go to St Andrews and tell me that's an affordable home at 5% below market value, no. which is 400,000. That's not affordable. And that's the key here. They throw out all these buzzwords and they tell us that it's going to be affordable um, and we will go, oh, that's fantastic. They're doing affordable housing in St Andrews. But when you actually look at the detail, it's actually... <laughs> You know, they're paying yeah. 380,000 instead of 390. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not so cool. You've got 10 grand off. It's a joke. <laughs> Literally. In areas where it's deprived, where, we're ne where we need housing, they say they can't afford to build. build. They say they can't afford to build. Why is that? Because they say if they're going to build social housing, the cost of the build is more than the value of the property once they've built it. Now, do you think at this point in time, the Scottish government are putting profit before the person? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to say, the, the value okay. of the property once it's finished shouldn't really matter because... Yeah. Exactly. And my response to that, to them, was you can't afford not to build social yeah. housing. You can't afford not to build council housing. Regardless yeah. of the price it's going to take to build it, people need a roof over their heads that are vulnerable in the society. And this is this is what this legislation stopped them doing. Why do I say that? Well, I can't take people, it can't give me garden tours now that are on universal credit. And mm -hmm. I told them that because... Yeah. If anything goes wrong with the universal credit system, I have to wait six months in before, rent do anything. before I could do anything. Yeah. And then I have to apply for the, the, the eviction, which is the last resort, which will take another three or four months. And then that's granted, it'll be another into a whole year. So I would go a whole year without rent. Now, let me, now most people will go, well, you could afford it, Jim. Well, I could probably absorb it on a one off. But let's look at the makeup according to the Freedom of Information Disclosure um, in 2020. So look up Google Freedom of Information Disclosure about how many landlords are in Scotland, how many own one property, how many own two property, and how many own more than three properties. So the makeup of landlords in Scotland is round about 230,000 landlords own one property, which represents 94% of the landlord population. The next one is, there's about 23,000, don't quote me on it, I'll not be exact here, but it is round about that, 23,000, which own two properties, which represents 5% of the landlord population. So we've now accounted to 99% of the landlord population in Scotland, okay, have now ownership of less than two properties, two properties or less. So if the landlords own two properties or less, that leaves 1% of the landlord population in Scotland with three properties or more. So how many is that? Well, it's 1,767 landlords in Scotland own three or more. So if there's 99% of the landlords in Scotland owning two or less properties, 94% owns one only, do you think that landlord can afford to go a whole year without rent? No, and that and, and the, these changes as well as tax changes and things as well. This is why I've got so many landlords that are just making the decision that they've, they've had enough, and because they they can't absorb it, and, and they're at the, the end of the point where they feel like it's worthwhile for them anymore, and that's a shame because yeah, yeah. it is still worthwhile. It's just um, people in that situation where they've only got one property. The I'm the picture is I've got an obligation to the people at our house right now, and I would yeah. and I can I can afford to stay in this business. Mm -hmm. But I've got an obligation to the people right now that are housed. And the last thing I want to do is, and I, you know, most people won't believe this. The last thing I want to do is be entirely selfish and just sell up and sit on a beach in Marbella. Yeah. Or Monaco. I know. And, and, and as we talk about the, the rent cap and, and the rent freeze and things, it's important to note that the current rent cap applies solely to the private rented sector. So there was a separate agreement reached to keep rent increases below inflation in the social, the Scottish social rented sector for the next coming financial year. Oh, I'll give you, I'll give you a, wee, so, a wee heads up with that. Yeah. Do you know the social housing providers that do mid-market rents as oh. well are allowed to increase their, their rent more than 3%? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're allowed to just throw they're allowed to do and just charge anything they want. Only the private landlords in the private sector that's had this. You can't make this up, eh? I know, I know. <laughs> But the problem here is then, if if a landlord is squeezed, like I've just explained, about 350, their interest only mortgage now, instead of 120, which was six months ago, mm -hmm. and they've got that extra out of 550 to pay, you know, because that's the rent they get, then what are they going to do when it comes to renewing the kitchen or the heating system or the windows or the bathroom? They're not, going to, have that They're not going to have surplus to upgrade the properties. And that's you've hit the nail on the head. It's a surplus because that's what the housing associations call it. It's not a profit. It's a surplus. Yeah. It's a surplus to reinvest back in the stock to, for the tenant's welfare. And therefore, you retain the tenant and they stay longer. Yeah. It's common business principles that you would do that. This is where we need to get through people's heads that we've just explained. 99% of the landlord population in Scotland do not own more than two properties. 
94% don't own two properties at all. They only own one. So I come back to saying, how on earth does people get this impression that these that the landlord population in Scotland is running about in Ferraris and having fantastic holidays in Monaco? Because they've not even got the money from property to do that. It comes from their own personal income. Because yeah. most landlords, most landlords actually are professionals who Still earn working. a lot of money elsewhere. And what they've done is a wee side avenue. In other words, I'll invest some of my money I've hard earned as a dentist, as a surgeon. We've got them, surgeons. Yeah. As a doctor, we've got them. Yeah. As an accountant, as an estate agent, as a letting agent. As somebody, as, an, as, as somebody just, you know, as a janitor, somebody that works as a janitor, okay, I'll put, instead of putting in my normal pension, I'll, I'll sign them and I'll put into, I'll put into property for my, for my welfare, for my future, for my pension. Yeah. A lot of the time I've got people in, and they've got savings in it, whether it's a couple or somebody on their own, and they've got savings and sitting in the bank, it's not doing anything. And they, they invest in property to obviously for the future. Yeah. And, and in the meantime, providing a service to the tenants by providing mm -hmm. housing. Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. So this is the case. We cannot then afford to do any upgrades or improvements to houses as landlords because of the because of the rent cap. And yeah. also, even worse, is the, the, the eviction suspension and how that's basically done. Now, I'll give you a case in point that's happened recently. Now we've had this one. When when was this one? It, we're just going to talk about it. Was just, we've just evicted after right. two and a half years. No, just about yeah. Yeah. So they went down. In, they went down just in lockdown. And okay. May, uh, so we just we just got this done and done in May. And then stopped paying the rent because they started taking it from the the, the universal credit in their Start, own they pocket. Were spending and spending yeah. it every single month. Universal credit would not allow us to transfer it to us, even though it was putting our tenancy in vulnerability, which is which is the rule straight away. As soon as mm -hmm. somebody becomes vulnerable and, and of eviction, then they should transfer it direct to us. But they refused to do that at her request. So then she went a whole year without paying her rent. And I couldn't evict her because there was a there was a ban on evictions at that point. So there's a whole year without rent. And in this time, just we offered assistance and put her in touch with private uh, rented solutions and they help people work through financial difficulty and help them sort out their benefits and things. And they actually at one point turned around and says, we can't help her anymore because she's been getting now been getting the rent and spending it. And we've got clear evidence of that. And, and they reported that back to the council and yeah. to us yeah. and stepped away. So then subsequently what as well happened is they then got her even more money, didn't they? To help her pay off their ears. And they gave it to her and she spent it. Yeah. So she got her rent twice to pay to keep her in her own tenancy, and she went and spent it twice. Now, to me, I'm no bother to, to a degree, but the, the, the key here is how on earth does the system allow someone to do that? Especially if you're wanting to keep them. I mean, she had young kids. This is yeah. this is why I left her there so long, because yeah. I didn't want our young kids to be, you know, in a and position we, we that they tried were, to keep they were being place. moved about in a transient, a transient fashion. So we tried their hardest to do that. So then she spent it again, and then we applied to the first year tribunal then for eviction because she was way beyond the six months rent arrears, yeah, and yeah. we demonstrated that. And then came back the backlash saying, "Oh, have you done this? Have you ticked that box? Have you done this? Have you done that box?" And then the complete, almost vilification of land of the landlord, which is me, from the first year tribunal when I've been in it for thirty years, and we've clearly demonstrated she's had her rent paid twice, and she's just gone and spent it. And yet they well, stopped that happening. What the tribunal also done, or what they done was, instead of giving us the, the normal period for eviction, they extended that because there was kids involved and we appreciate that, but we'd already been exercising that in that way because we knew there was children involved. We were yeah, at the end yeah. of it, but they extended that further. So then that's fine. And we, we then went with the process and it wasn't until just may it was in may we eventually done and we had to do sheriff's officers and things do you know that's probably i think i don't think i, I was trying to remember the last, if i've ever actually done the whole process to that point where we're standing at the door i think i might have done it once years ago it's not something yeah. that we do and do you know and you know the funny thing but well, it's not funny but do you know the most ludicrous thing and i've actually never tell you this jim because i forgot i just as we say this I found out through word of mouth that the day we done the, the sheriff's officer, she was on holiday. 
So she went away on holiday. So yeah. she was basically spending the rent on going on holiday. She was on a holiday the day that we done that eviction. So, so what I'm trying to say is the legislation currently right now isn't doesn't doesn't work properly. No. So the legislation in theory and principle works well. Here's another classic example. There is there is people that are in tenancies right now that are earning more than the landlords, but they're protected from the rent increasing. Yeah. And yet they're earning more than the landlord themselves. And the landlord's having to subsidise them and the landlord's earning less than them. That's what the legislation does. That's how stupid it is. I know. And and it's a shame. If, if people, if landlords, find themselves in the in the situation where they're, they've only got a property or maybe they've got two, one or two properties and they're in that position, it's no surprise that some of them are walking away. And I feel yeah. I feel really yeah. ashamed for them because you could be you could be a tenant on an income of a hundred thousand a year, and we've had it, haven't we? Mm -hmm. We've had tenants on income hundred thousand, fifty thousand, thirty thousand, forty thousand, sixty thousand, yeah. eighty thousand, seventy thousand. You could be a tenant at any income like that, and you could be earning more than the landlord themselves, who's only on probably about twenty five, thirty thousand. The average salary is thirty three and five. They're only about thirty three, so they're earning more. And then your your rent is only restricted to go up 33 percent at, yeah. at, at the most, and then at six percent if they can justify the increase. But I just explained how that works and how, ends up being how it doesn't anyway. make sense. You've got to incur twelve percent to get six percent within a six month period, though, which yeah, is very very rare. Yeah. So, for example, like if your expenses were eight percent, you would only get four percent. So it's no surprise then that most landlords, a lot of landlords, are actually exiting this market, Richard, aren't they? Yeah. Do you think it'll ever recover? I think the legislation needs to change a lot. Um, I mean, there is a lot of new investors and landlords coming in that are that are a lot more positive about the situation and and are really keen on providing good. Do you think that's naivety? No, they not don't necessarily. Know what happened. Um, maybe on maybe some maybe on some parts, but I mean, I make it clear what the situation is when I'm speaking to new investors, and this is how this is how things work now. Yeah, um, and be very transparent. Like I say, obviously, as an agent, I need to I, I I need to keep up on what the current status is with legislation and, and regulations and all the rest of it. And that and we like to know that all our landlords, investors, and our tenants are all aware of what the situation is. So here's the oh, main yeah. thing that I'm yeah. going to talk about, which is yeah. unfair. If tenants are restricted to a 3% increase, mm -hmm. no matter what their income is, to protect them from the cost of living moving up, and the landlord is not protected with their mortgage, then why is a homeowner actually not protected with their mortgage either then? Yeah, because because as, as the homeowner the is the homeowners are, are the same person. So the why are they not going to the banks and said like they did in the nineteen thirties? Because they did do it in the nineteen thirties. They actually went to the banks and said we're only we're going to cap your we're going to cap your mortgages so mm -hmm. you can't charge the homeowners any more yeah. than what you're charging them right now. Because I mean, homeowners are basically a, a bank's tenant. Yeah. But they won't go up against the bank, will they? No. Because the banks will wipe the floor with the Scottish government, won't they? Yeah. Yeah, effectively. So it's the fact that the Scottish government's got, the, the banks have got muscle, whereas, whereas private landlords, because we're so disseminated, there's only, you know, because if you've only got one property, why would you care? It's like, I'll just sell. I'll just sell. I'll just exit the market. I'm no bother. I'll put my money somewhere else. Yeah. It's no big hassle to me. Because I've only got one property. I've only got two properties. Well, that's 99% of the landlord population in Scotland. So hey, just sell. If you're a landlord, just sell. Don't don't go through the hassle. Let the government reap what they sow. Yeah. Because if every landlord that had one or two properties, if they turned around tomorrow and says we're all selling, there would be a, there would be a very big issue. Yeah. Very big problem. Now, do you know why I'm talking about this right now? Because in a year or two years' time, if this continues to go on, it's going to get worse. Yeah. And this is exactly what I've told the Scottish government right now, and I've actually told the housing minister right now. And at the end of this month, at the housing North East Fife's housing summit in St Andrews, yeah, the, the housing the, the housing minister will be there, 
and I'll be telling him these exact same things again. So when I turn around in two years' time and say, I told you so, they can't get away with it because I've now recorded it. And it's here yeah. as proof that these were the issues that I discussed with them. And it's all their information. This is made up by me. This is all facts from their documentation. Yeah. So yeah, the that's, all, that's is, all public information as well, Jim. The difficulty here is coming back to saying the vulnerable the, the, the vulnerable tenants are suffering the most because mm -hmm. I can't take the vulnerable tenants anymore because they can't get a garden tour because I need a garden tour to make sure that somebody's going to be able to pay this rent. And yeah. anybody out there says, but universal credit will pay it for them, you don't understand how universal credit works. It's a terrible system mm -hmm. because... If the tenant doesn't do anything about it, or if they make it, they make it so difficult for the tenant sometimes in the hoops that they have to jump through, they don't understand what they need to do next. Therefore, their their claim is never put back in place again. The rent's never paid. Therefore, what happens is the the rears rack up and then they're evicted. Yeah. And then everybody Unless wonder. Everybody says that's horrible. A private landlord doing that to you, but it's like, okay, how many other industries out there do you know? Anybody, whatever your job is right there, this is what I'm going to challenge you right now. Anybody that's got a job, anybody that works in any industry right now, how would you feel if I came in and used your service at your office or your product at your offering and actually says, yep, I'll use it or I'll take it. A car, for example, I'll take it out the garage. I'll drive it about for a couple of weeks. But I don't know what I pay for that. No, 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 I don't want to pay for that. Or, well, we'll take it back. No, no, sorry, you can't take it back until you go through a court and get it back. But you're yeah. going to have to take a year to get it back. And I'm just going to continue to drive about and use your product or service for as long as I want. And with no repercussions, and you can't do anything about it. That's exactly how the private rented sector works right now. Yeah, that is a really good analogy of how that, I mean, that is, that is basically how it is. And that's, and to listen to that, and anybody listening and watching will think that's ludicrous, but that's exactly how it is. And, and, and to reference the universal credit system, unless that the universal credit claim is managed properly, or you allow, or the tenant allows somebody to manage it properly, who knows what they're doing with it, it's very difficult. And if it's, that's what I mean, a lot of tenants are more than willing for us to help them set up correctly and do we take guidance? Because it is, it's a difficult system. But if, if not, it's, it's flawed as well. I understand that completely because in the very beginning, 30 years ago when I first started, I actually sat down with every single tenant and actually went through their application for housing yeah. benefit every single time. And I tipped all the right boxes and I actually got trained by the local authority. So I actually had a really good relationship with the local authority and I said, how am I going to, how am I going to do this? I'm going to have to help them fill these out because these, these, these these forms are horrendous. Yeah. They will have no idea what you're doing here. So I need to help them fill them out. So I used to sit down with them, help them fill them out, help them all then put all the right information in. By the way, just in case anybody uh, says anything, all oh, right, you shouldn't know that information. I had a data protection exemption statement from the tenant themselves. So yes. I was able to do that on their behalf. And the local authority were fine with that. As long that as reason. it was signed and yes. an agreement, yeah. And I was able to present that to them. That's why they accepted the application on their behalf. Um, so we were able to put that all in and get it all in and get it all up and running because the local authority wanted people to have roofs over their head. However, the local authority don't administer universal credit now. They don't administer it. So it's a, it's a, it's a government body and it's a centralised source. And this is what's caused the problem. And this is why people don't want to deal with universal credit. And it makes it even worse that people don't want universal credit because of the current situation with the with the rent fees and also especially the suspension of, of evictions yeah because if, if there's any repercussions and there's there's nowhere for you to go with that you're basically on skint row and you're have you're going to have to pay everything out of your pocket to keep that going if you've got a mortgage and then that leaves the people that are in receipt of universal credit as their source of paying the rent people that are turning their backs on use it are allowing people using that system to pay the rent it's then are leaving them vulnerable again to, and open to being homeless and to turn to social housing well they're on a very very long list okay let's get back to so the rent cap conditions apply to all existing private residential and assured and short assured tenancies yeah. 
Um, while Fife landlords can reset, or landlords in general, this is because this applies to everywhere. We just said Fife because we're Fife properties. Yeah, but this you is across the whole. Of reset rents in between tenancies. Reset, while we can reset rents in between tenancies, this causes another problem as well. So this is about holding back the tide, because what they're doing right now is the Scottish government is holding back the tide of the rent increases with people that are in situ right now. Now the problem here is most people in tenancies. And this is right through the landlord population. Have never really been in, the rents never been increased while they've been in situ in tenancy. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a tenant that's been there for ten years and you've never increased the rent, now I had one that was there for twenty years. Yeah, and I never increased the rent from day one. And yeah, yet, his rent and was yet, the same all that time. Yeah, could you imagine? I hadn't increased the rent for then day one. The rent is now five hundred and fifty when I was actually charging four hundred. But but the, the, the freeze and the freeze on rents comes in and I can only increase by three percent now. Yeah. And that's a lot of current tenancies right now. But even worse, because the new market rate is two hundred four uh, uh, five fifty and it's four hundred, that tenant can no longer move to another property because they can't afford the big jump now. Yeah. Because their lifestyle has been created on the fact that they've only put 400 aside 400. every single month. Whereas if it had increased incrementally over, the, yes. over that If it period. increased incrementally over time, if you allowed it to increase to, to match up to the current market rent, they would have been able to afford it. Because what, what this is, is when you look at this, Richard, a rent of 550, right? Now, the, the government defines, the Scottish government defines uh, rent poverty as 25% or more of your gross income. Mm -hmm. So if your rent's 550, Okay, 550 times um, 12, uh, 6,600. Okay. Yep. Now, the average salary in Fife, and it's a fact, is 33,000. So yep. divide that by 33,000, 20%. Nowhere near rent poverty. There's actually still another 5% of that to go, which represents times 0 0.05, uh, another Another 1,650. So, which is effectively another 137, which is that 150 quid. But yeah. because because the tenant has that, and like everybody, your standard of living moves up to that rate. And then you go and rent, you go and hire a car, or you go and lease a car, you go and get a bigger, a bigger something else, and you have more nights out, you have better quality yeah. holidays and all the rest of it. And then it's like you haven't learned to rein it in now because you don't understand any principles of budgeting at all. So therefore, when the when a tenant does need to move because of circumstances, because that's usually why, why tenants move. So yeah. I'm in a two bedroom now. I really need a three because we've got another baby coming along. Uh, you can't because the government's held that at an artificially low rate for such a long time. Therefore, when you go to the the one when it's reset for the new tenancies that come along, they're all getting advertised at five fifty to six hundred. So you can't. And your answer to that, and people go, well, why do you know just take the six hundred and, and put a put a, a what what we call a um uh oh god what is a static tenancy or something like that. I can't, it was before nineteen eighty eight, before that housing act nineteen eighty eight came in. They they put what what regulated tenancy, that was it. They had regulated tenancies which they said that is it for the rest of your life. That's the rent you're getting and you're only allowed to put it up by inflation every single year, if that at all. God I wish they'd be able to do that now, to be honest. <laughs> Just <think laughs> because that. regulated tenancies. <laughs> anyway what happened with that, though, is over a period of time, it was proportionally lower than everybody else's. Therefore, it destroyed the value of the house. So regulated tenancies have been proven not to work, and that's why the Housing Act 1988 was brought in for Scotland and England for that reason. Yeah, I've been reading about it this morning. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, so, yeah, we, we, we speak about, obviously, the 3% and then the 6% and things. So, but, yeah. but in the 6%, I mean, what, what are the exemptions for the rent cut and things when we do the exemption for that like but the, the exemptions for that for the six percent oh precise, precise cost. so so here's here's the rent cut um prescribed costs such as interest on the home loan so this is how yep. you calculate it so this is okay. where they calculate the increase and to justify the six percent if you can get it yeah is how much in that period that six month period of time has the mortgage gone up maybe yeah. or possibly the standard security of, of the rental property, on the rental property, uh, the insurance premiums have gone up, the service charges have gone up, you know, on, on a tenant's contract. Uh, you know, that's in England, by the way. Yeah. 
But also, the, the thing that's included in that is, is if you've got factor fees and things in a building. Yeah, factor fees, um, what else? Uh, anything. You know, I, I think contractors as well, to be honest. I mean, it doesn't, it, we don't actually say it, but I think you can demonstrate contractors' costs from year on year have gone up, then you're entitled oh, yeah. to increase your rent. Labor and materials have shot you, you, You're a hard job to do that because you've got to provide, you've got to provide concrete evidence. That's so which so you would need to then provide evidence from what they were to what you're being charged. Is that yeah, what you're trying to say? Uh, looking for a three bedroom in Ely for under thirty thousand, uh, is that per month then? <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no, it's not that much. Really. Ely's Ely's not that much in terms of rent. Well, I, we've just we I've got a two bedroom um, apartment, Aerosphere, eight fifty. 850, a two-bedroom apartment. Right, looks right across the golf course at you, uh, Aerosphere. Big That's apartment, close. quite That's nice. quite a good price. Yes. So, landlords must apply to the Rent Service Scotland up, to cover up to half the increased costs of the increase, limited to a maximum of 6% at, at, the, at, at least uh, in, to September uh, 2023. That's what yeah, they do. So this is the end, the end of this year, yeah. So the suspension on evictions does not prevent the landlord from seeking court orders for eviction. However, as I said before, the court system, the first teacher tribunal and court system, um, first teacher tribunal especially, is making it so difficult um, for people to actually apply for the evictions. And what has happened as well is most of, if not all, of the, the grounds now are no longer mandatory. They're all discretionary. So you think you're going to sell your house and you're going to get your house back in two months under the current legislation. But if the court determines that your tenant's need is greater than your need, you're not getting to sell your house. No. The tenant doesn't need to move out. They'll not grant the eviction. I'll say that again, because a lot of people are out there under a false illusion about what's going on here. I know. If you're a landlord and you want to sell your property because you need the money, you have to clearly demonstrate that you'll need that money. If you you're earning you 30,000, 50,000 somewhere else in your normal day-to-day -day job, which has got nothing to do with your property investment, nothing to do with that at all, if you're earning anything outside of that and you have a surplus, the court could look at that as no longer financial hardship. Yeah. You just want to sell your house. If the tenant comes along and says they've got nowhere else to go because of their need and the fact that the house is adapted to their need and they've been living in it for so long, and it'll, it'll upset everybody, then the government does not need to allow that. The, no, the, the first teacher of, you know, does not need to grant that order. So if you think you're going to sell your house to, to, to do this, think again. You're going to have to start the journey pretty quick. And there's a few landlords I've spoke to, and, and they are in a position in that they, they, they maybe not need to sell, but now want to sell. And I've, I've had to clearly explain to them a few times, that's not how it works. You can't just simply sell it. And, and it's quite hard for people to grasp because it's, well, how could I not sell my property? It's my property, but... Yeah, you can't even sell your own property yeah. without the government's approval, without the yeah. government or even... Something that you own. Uh, approval. Yeah, that's got your money tied up in it and you own the title for it. You cannot sell unless you're in the right circumstances. So enforcement for eviction actions is suspended until the restrictions are lifted and, uh, unless an exemption applies in, yes. in, in the cases that we're talking about. So there so are, what, are exemptions. What are the exemptions then? So exemptions include cases of criminality, obviously mm -hmm. that's one, and antisocial behaviour. Now, mm -hmm. antisocial behaviour, you need to prove that as well. You need really, uh, you need a timeline, you need evidence. No yeah. I'll be honest, you've got no chance of proving antisocial behaviour because... It's quite a difficult the, one. Yeah, because the, the process requires you to have um, everybody involved and monitoring it all, and then police reports and local authority reports and reports from the neighbours, all detailed and documented, and then submitting all that to prove that antisocial behaviour in the first place. So that's the only way you'll be able to do that. And, you know, in all honesty, I've never had anybody in 30 years, when I've told them to do that, they've gone, oh, I didn't bother. <laughs> it's too much hassle. <laughs> yeah, so antisocial behaviour is one, um, but that's difficult to, to prove. So what's the Also, one? if a tenant abandons the property, now but again... Again, if... no easy to prove. You need to, you I need had to come back after a, I had somebody come back after a year and a half or two years and claimed I've been in Brazil for two years and want my <laughs> house back. Yeah. Sorry? You've been, you've been away in Brazil for two years on holiday. You've never paid your rent for two years and you're wanting your house back now. 
Yeah. All of a sudden, because I'm taking it back. And do you know that case? I remember that case. And do you know we kept the possessions. Uh, well, I mean, because I mean, we thought, well, there was a lot of personal things and whatever, and so we, we, and we stored them. I mean, you, we stored them at your expense, Jim. Um, and I, I mean, I just think people are their, their perception of things is crazy. But that's I just went to get rid of them after a month, but, oh. but I didn't. I kept them all that time. Yeah, for we kept year. them all that time. Yeah. And then she found her. She found her new house, and then she had the goal to come back and say, "Where's my stuff?" Yeah. <laughs> You could have paid your rent for two years, and I've had to store them for a year, all your furnishings and fixtures, and then you're coming back to me and saying, where's my stuff? But you're yeah. not wanting to pay your rent. Yeah, so abandonment's one, but again, you need to prove that. You need to be able to provide evidence that supports abandonment. Also, if the mortgage, mortgage lender intends to sell the property, which is a repossession, if you're, if you're in that position, unfortunately. And no, when a landlord... The banks. Yeah. No, it's all appease the banks straight away, because they don't want to argue with the banks. And if a landlord plans to live in a property due to financial hardship, uh, again, you've got to demonstrate financial hardship, yeah, don't you? You really need to prove that. So, uh, if you've got, like you've got, really if you've got other income, job, a good plain job, you've got no chance to sell on the property. Yeah. yeah. And then, obviously, like we've covered, the substantial rent arrears of six months of rent also qualifies and as an exemption. But there's a Who's whole process to, for that. What landlord out of 94% of landlords in Scotland? can afford to have a hit of six months with no rent when they're having to pay a mortgage. Now, at the, and, at the, and at the point we're at just now, this, I mean, if evictions proceedings had started before the 6th of September 2022, the restrictions don't apply. But I think by the, by the time where we are in this year now, most evictions that were in place before that point are probably being followed through. I would hope so. Anyway. Well, literally, oh, that's yeah. when we just got over the line last week. Yeah. <laughs> think about that. There that's was no true. restriction for what we did. Mm -hmm. And we actually put it in the day before the 6th of September. Because yeah, I remember I remember phoning you up and going, have you got that in? Yep, we've yeah. got it in. We put it on the 5th of September, and that never replied to the restrictions. And it took October to October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June. So it was near the end months. of the day. It took almost six, uh, no, sorry. That's eight months. months. I was just going to say, Jim. Nine, eight, eight, nine months. A lot well, it was, it was eight going on nine months, yeah. From nine the start months of the eviction process. On a normal procedure with the start of the eviction process, and it was two years with no rent. It's got to be in the we went through a lot before that. And because yeah. the government kept her in there. Even though she got her rent paid twice and she spent it twice. And a lump it was a lump sum thing that she received. But it's crazy, yeah. Absolutely crazy. Now hopefully people will get the gist of here and the fact that you know, this is this is the difficulty that most landlords and letting agents are going through right now. And again, you know, Ross Greer will get his wee harp out, but I'll say to Ross Greer from the, you know, the Greens, the one that vilifies landlords as well, and the fact that, but you and your pensions and gambling, smoking, drinking, all these industries. So you're taking advantage of all these vulnerable people with addictions. And, and none, of, none of these... Eh? Sorry, on you go. And all these, all these people, all these people as well, usually have care through, you know, Galaxo or Smith Klein Beecham, and you're actually investing in that as well. So even worse, you're taking advantage of their illnesses. So Ross Greer, next time, maybe you better think about that. Yeah. If anybody gets a chance, tag Ross Greer and Patrick <laughs> Harvey in this. This is really interesting. This will get right up them. I would love to. And, you know, uh, Debate Scotland, I actually asked, is he going to be there in Edinburgh this last week? Because <laughs> I would love to be there on the panel one. Uh, I would, you know, I would take them at task straight away. You know, they think they're whiter than white, the Greens, and also every other MSP is like this, or any MP, in terms of vilifying landlords, but they don't understand they're exactly the same, probably worse. I wouldn't say they're the same, actually, because we're actually providing the for people's heads. <laughs> Anyway, to enforce the rent cap, tenants can refer the rent increase to the rent officer. Okay, so tenants can uh, refer the rent increase to the rent officer to verify compliance. Yeah. This is particularly useful in cases where rent includes additional costs like energy bills. Um, but in the case of unlawful evictions, the bill will, um, will amend the Housing Scotland Act 1988 to calculate damages based on a multiplication of monthly rent. Okay. We don't know what that is. Uh, for student tenants in Scotland, 
the legislation has considered the unique circumstances. Why that's unique, I do not know. They're still renting the house. Uh, well, most students' accommodations, such as halls of residence and multi-purpose student housing, have indicated a little interest in increasing rents mid-tenancy, but either did private landlords. Either did private landlords. You hear what they're saying here? The measures will still apply to these providers to ensure greater assurance for student tenants, but it doesn't apply. Student tenants are actually, you know, student landlords are actually um, exonerated. Yeah. They, you know, they've been left out. It's like, so, but, but, but it's exactly the same principle, isn't it? David actually did a good one here. Uh, in the link here, I'm not really sure who's post this on, if it might be my personal one, um, but he's got the crowd justice um, yes. for the stop, uh, stop rent controls. Um, this is actually the Scottish government. So we're taking the, the landlords, the SAL, um, the Scottish Association of Landlords, and with the support of landlord members and the public landlords as well, not including them, are actually putting together, and we've taken them, the, what they're saying here, to judicial review. So why are we doing that? Because basically they've taken a marginalised section of society, people are in minority. Imagine, imagine if I came to you saying, Richard, and saying, do you know there's a group of people in Scotland that are in the minority that are being constantly picked on and vilified by the by other people? Would you be outraged? Of course you would. Yes, you would. And yet that's private landlords. Yeah. Now would you be outraged? Ask yeah. most of these people. Most of these people would say, oh, fuck, it's private landlords. I mean, I'm swearing, but I mean, that's really it, isn't it? Most of these people out there probably watching and tuning in, as soon as they heard it was a private yeah. landlord, they said, oh, well, wait a minute, that's a, that's a different story. These people make profit. Yeah, I did I did actually mean to mention earlier when you when you said about, obviously, the Scottish government won't challenge the banks because they have a lot more power than them. But then I think that's why it's important that landlords come together through Sal and obviously this crowd justice, uh, the, the, the link there that takes you through to obviously contributing to fighting against the Scottish government as a, as a whole unified body true Scottish Association of Landlords it's so important to give us all a voice as one. I'm just going to go on and put uh, Scottish Association of Landlords in here and yep. I'm going to put it myself because I can put this right across the platforms copy and paste um, paste now here's the Scottish Association of Landlords uh, the links in the post there it should go out to all the various pages yeah, yep, it is. That. yeah that's cool. um, I'll quickly look for the crowd justice um, um, one, uh, if I could see that in here, it says on a vital market update, tenant fund, housing tribunal published, extension ramp, uh, ramp cost of living campaign. Uh, this could be out here, uh, cost of living campaign, in my consultation, cost of living judicial hearing. Uh, read the four article, and we have, yeah, crowd justice. Here it is, here. Here is the stop rent controls. Um, you, uh, hopefully you've all tuned into this and you realise um, how rent controls are bad for tenants. Yeah. Um, I, you know, if you've not, then I urge you to go back and listen to the podcast. It's on our channels. Um, it's on our social media channels for Five Properties. It's on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, it's on Anchor. It's on Spotify. Uh, and it will be the, sport, the, the, the podcast for this one it's, itself. Um, so there's the crowd justice case and and how you can read more about that and then obviously contribute to that if you want if you're a landlord out there you need to do it um and you, it's not of a day now where you could turn around and say to yourself well i've only got one property it's nothing to do with me because that's exactly what the government wants because if you've only got one property um then it's divide and conquer isn't it yeah so we need to take a stand in some sort of way for letting agents especially if you're a letting agent and you've got three or four hundred properties that you're managing, you should be contributing a small amount for every single property you manage. Because it's important, because it's your future as well. And if you yeah. don't think as a letting agent you should do that, you shouldn't be in this industry at all then. Mm -hmm. Because you don't understand the dynamics of it. And I would say that then it's clearly all about money for you. And that's not what the letting yeah. in industry is about, the letting agent industry is about. Fair enough, you'll make a decent return on what you're doing, but it's also dealing with people every single day. We're not yeah. in the business of making money. We're on the people business. Yeah, and, and you've got a duty to care as well. A, make a living as a result of it. Sorry, Richard, what did you say? I'm, just, I'm saying as an agent, you've got a duty to care as well. 
for your, your tenants. So I would say to letting agents out there as well, please contribute to this. It is important. It's the it's the right time. Okay. Um, right, okay. So where are we right now then, Richard? Multipurpose, the student lets have been let off. Uh, the yep. councils have been let off where rent increases. They can just write a cheque for whatever they want and charge a, a, a rent for anything they want. And, and then also um, the social housing providers, the housing associations have been let off as well. Now, here's the key here. When I wrote to the housing minister, and again, I'll document this. Uh, I've actually got the documentation here, probably. Yeah, here it is here for anybody. Here's my response from the housing minister. Everybody see that? Scottish government. Yeah, back a wee bit, yeah. Scottish government in there. I'm just letting everybody see it. Scottish government, housing minister. So when I got the reply back from the housing minister about who did the consult um, in terms of the private renting sector to, you know, because you... Because the UK government obviously consults people and bodies before they go ahead and implement the legislation to make sure they understand the ramifications of how it could affect people overall. So how many people did you do you think at the Scottish Housing Minister consulted last year when they put the legislation in place on the 6th of September? How many people do you think? No, be honest. Be honest. I know. Actually. I think it's some ridiculous. Be honest, like if I was to ask you for the first time, how many would you say? I would have thought it would have been over a, a thousand. Yeah, okay. No one. I know it's I know. Zero. No one. Zilch. I would, I would no have thought it would have been a, a snapshot of several hundred. No, con no consultation with housing associations. No consultation with social landlords. No consultation with tenants. Nothing. Zero zilch when they put it in. Complete naivety. Hence the reason why they took another month to find out what they were meant to be doing in the first place. Because we actually asked them. And then when I got the response saying, once they'd done this and they did it again, when they responded back to me and said, um, they said, it, we didn't have anyone to consult on behalf of the private rented sector about, as a stakeholder, on behalf of landlords, about the cost of living rent increases, the eviction and the eviction ban. Okay, so which subsequently I replied to and said, but surely you would have consulted the Scottish Association of Landlords because you approved them as a contractor to train yeah. and approve letting agents. Yeah. To which they said, shit, we never yeah. thought about that. Never thought about that. <laughs> and then they or subsequently did... called them in for an emergency did... meeting. <laughs> After the event, once the, once the, once the stable Let's... doors been opened or closed or whatever it is, the horse is bolted down the field and it's off into the horizon. Then they said, Oh well, oh right, okay, we better, we better, we better, we better dig ourselves out of this hole then. And that's why they did that. So that's... is it right to then vilify private landlords and letting agents for what they do and put a roof over people's heads that are vulnerable in the society? No, of course it's not. And I would ask people out there as well, is it right to vilify someone that puts a roof over someone else's head that doesn't have anywhere else to go? So anyway, let's let's wrap up here. Yeah. Because I get, you know, you know I've been political about this all the time. And it's true. It's true. I just want people, I'm not bothered about anyone else's opinion really. What I'm bothered about is the fact that the misinformation that the public out there are getting. Yeah, it's helping people understand yes. the actual situation. I want them to understand what the real task is at hand. And and and, and if the Scottish government's trying to blame the private landlords, I want them to realise exactly where the blame lies. And it's called an incoherent and an inept housing strategy since 2006, since they've been in power all the time. They've failed to do anything about it. They failed to see this coming, even though they were told loads and loads of times by myself and several other people for that reason. They've just failed to see it coming. So if you're a landlord, you've got any questions or require further clarification regarding the measures, um, please hey, reach out, contact yes. us, um, speak to us, and, uh, and we'll see if we can help you. If you're stuck in a certain situation, I get a lot of private messages from people saying, oh, my God. It's like, what do I do? And, what I, and I, I dig people out of the hole sometimes and give them the right advice. 
Um, we're here to assist you, provide you with the right uh, genuine uh, guidance and ensure compliance and a smooth renting experience, um, both for you know for for landlords and tenants in our yeah, area. Yeah, for both. For both. Uh, but sure. subsequently, you know, there's there's obviously landlords and tenants uh, somewhere else. And see, this is a classic example. Clearly. Oh, okay. Let Let's finish it there because I'm going to go into TikTok after this. This is a big <laughs> one, and I don't really want to give them a voice anywhere else other than over the other 15 channels. We'll just deal directly yeah. with TikTok. Oh, that was good, Jim. So if you've got if you've got five minutes, I recommend you just jump over to TikTok on our five property channel. Okay, <laughs> then you'll have a good laugh. Anyway, bye bye for now. Okay, bye. Thanks for that.